I love hearing that story from John Dieter and, uh, and Joel McAvoy. That's Pastor Bruce's oldest son, and, and they serve together. I think that's a beautiful picture of the church. You've got John Dieter, an empty nester. Joel McAvoy, a high school student, serving young children together. And in doing that together, they grow, they learn from each other, and it makes an impact in them. And that's what the church is supposed to be about. So, by the way, uh, for all the middle school and high school students who are here this morning, would you put a hand up? If I see a couple of you here. Some of you up there? Yes. I want you to hear your pastor say, you're not the church of tomorrow. You're the church of today. We need you right now as you're part of our church family. You're, you're a vital part of who we are as a church. In fact, it's not just that the adults want to invest in you. Frankly, I'm hoping some of you and your passion will shape up some of these adults spiritually when you get involved. So we're thrilled that you're a part of our worship and, uh, and getting involved in serving. If you want to do that, look for a place to serve. We encourage you to find out that we'd love to help you connect there either in our church services, during programs, or in the community throughout the week. We love that. Let's, let's bow in prayer as we, as we open God's word together. Father, we come now to talk about this thing called grace, which we desperately need but often fail to understand. So by your grace, open our minds and hearts that we might understand you, that you might speak what we need to hear. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as Brian said, we begin a new series this summer called Uncomfortable Grace, examining throughout the New Testament primarily scriptures about what is grace? How does it work? Grace is is without a doubt the most important concept in the Bible. It's the most important concept in the world. We live in a world of people starving for grace, but with no real understanding of what it is, how it works, or how to get it. We all have reasons why grace is hard to understand and difficult to accept. I, one of my hangups with grace was that when I was in eighth grade, I had a crush on a girl named Grace. And I asked her to an eighth grade dance, and she would, grace rejected me, which theologically messed with my head for years, you know? She rejected me for a boy named Neil Schwann, so I had a problem with grace. Well, actually, I had a problem with Neil Schwann, but that's a different story. So for years, I didn't understand grace. How could grace reject me? We're calling this series Uncomfortable Grace because while grace is amazing, while it's life-changing, it's not cheap, it's not easy, it's not comfortable. Uncomfortable grace means, first of all, the, the, facing the truth that you're a sinner in need of it, that your life's not okay, that you have broken places, that you have shameful places, that you need the grace of God. Grace is also uncomfortable because once you accept that, you want to become a channel of his grace, you want to become a messenger of his grace, and you can't do that from a distance. To share God's grace with somebody in a personally means you get close enough to their own brokenness, to their own sinfulness, to their own messiness, to communicate God's grace to them. Theologian and author Paul David Tripp says uncomfortable grace, he says it calls it his theology of uncomfortable grace, and you'll see this quote here, which I find very helpful. He says, God will take you where you haven't intended to go in order to produce in you what you could not achieve on your own. I love that. God's going to take you somewhere closer to him and closer to his people, which a place you wouldn't in your own comfort zone choose to go. Why? to change you, to do something in you that could happen no other way, and that's grace. We live in a world of competition, of achievement, of earning. You get what you deserve. No free lunch, my grandfather used to say, and I never understood that because I was 12 years old. My mom packed it for me for free, I thought, every day. Grace is fundamentally not about what you deserve. That's karma. Karma is about what you deserve. Grace is about getting what you do not deserve and not getting what you do deserve which the Bible says is death. While everyone desperately needs grace, it's not really about us. At its core, grace is about the character and nature of God. It's about the undeserved, unsought, extravagant demonstration of the love of God. Michael Horton, theologian, writes, in grace, God gives nothing less than himself. Grace, then, is not a third thing mediating between a holy God and sinful people. But it is Jesus Christ. Grace in action. So grace does not come to us as an abstract concept or a philosophy or five bullet points. It comes to us as a person, which brings us to our text this morning, John chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. John 1, we'll read verses 14 through 18. I regret we don't have time to walk through all of the first parts of John because it's such an amazing uh, first chapter of his gospel, but we'll read these verses for our purposes of understanding grace. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, 
glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him, and he cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Now, if you've read through John chapter 1, some of you I know have and have studied this, the first 18 verses of John chapter 1 are a watershed moment, not just in religious history, but in philosophical and literary history. It's an astounding thing John is saying. John is saying, uh, he blows through the, the stories of the Old Testament and, and blasts apart the prevailing philosophies of his day, saying essentially this, there is and has always been a, a divine first principle behind all that exists. He calls this the word, the logos in Greek, where we get our English word logic from. But it means sort of rational first principle, the thing that upholds all that exists. He even says nothing was made without the word. Everything that has been made was made by the word or through the word. The word was with God and the word was God, meaning it's God who's behind it all, this first principle. And this divine first principle that upholds everything through which everything came into existence actually took on flesh and blood and walked around. Nothing like this had been uttered ever before in human history. The word, the logos, that which upholds all that exists, takes on flesh and blood and becomes one of us. This is unique in all of history. Eugene Peterson, in his uh, book, The Message, a paraphrase, says that the word took on flesh and moved into the neighborhood. I love that phrase. Of course, John is talking about Jesus. Jesus is the Word. He, all things were made through him and by him. He upholds all things. And John says, when we saw the Word in flesh and blood, we saw the glory of the Father. And what did that look like? John says, well, it was full of grace and truth. The way I can describe the glory of God walking around is that he was full of grace and truth. Now, we have a pretty flimsy understanding of both of those concepts in our culture. How many of you have heard the phrase, fake news? Anybody? We all chuckle nervously. Where is this going, right? Whatever, side of, whatever political ideology you have, whatever side of the aisle you're on, the phrase, fake news, in our culture has come to mean essentially this. News that I don't agree with and I don't like because it offends my sensibilities of what I believe to be true. Therefore, I go to the Internet, that great arbiter of all truth, and I find other facts to prop up what I believe to be true, and that's real news, right? And both sides are doing this. But the Bible says, regardless of popular cultural view, regardless of personal preference or desire or upbringing or your ideological viewpoint, truth is not subjective. It transcends your preferences and desires. It is an objective reality whether you want it to be or not, and you can only bow before it and surrender to it, which itself is liberating, though very few people see it that way until they have bowed. Truth transcends your feelings and your desires. But let's look now at the nature of grace. The nature of grace. The nature of grace, the essence of grace, the Bible says grace is at its core, is undeserved, unsought, unearned, incredible favor of God himself. It's a gift at its core. At its very core, grace is a gift. A gift cannot be earned or it's not a gift. Doesn't it, mom and dad, doesn't it rob the magic of Christmas or wouldn't it if your children come to you when they're young and say, listen, I've got a list here of why I deserve an iPhone 7. And therefore, I demand the iPhone 7, and I'll be expecting the iPhone 7 on December 25th, right? It's no longer a gift of grace, is it? And now you're in some sort of negotiation. It sort of robs the, the power of it. Grace cannot be earned. It cannot be coerced. It cannot be demanded. It can only be received or rejected. In one sense, all of life is a gift of grace. You are here by grace. I mean, in this room, Breathing in and out right now. Think about this for a minute. Your heart right now is beating in your chest. It's pumping blood throughout all of your blood vessels, throughout all of your body. It's keeping you alive, and you are not willing it to do so. It's just doing it. Boom, 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 boom. Your whole life it's been doing it. You never once had to think about it or make it do so. Until some of you maybe have had some procedures, and then you thought about it. 
and you realize, I'm grateful for this gift. But you're not, you're not making that happen. You didn't earn that. You didn't even ask for it because you didn't exist before it. It just was given to you. There's, uh, my, my, my family and I went to see the musical Hamilton, which is fantastic, by the way. I don't love musicals that much. Part of the reason is that the actors periodically dance and break into song, which annoys me. But this particular one was fantastic. I had read the biography of Hamilton's life from Chernow, and I was really into the history, and it was really fantastic. We had a great time as a family seeing that. There's a part in the musical where Hamilton and his wife, Eliza, uh, they, they say this phrase back and forth to each other in different songs. They say, look around, look around at how lucky we are to be alive right now. That's a great statement. It's a theological statement. It's a grace statement. You're, you're alive by grace. But that's not all that grace is. It is a gift, an unsought, undeserved gift. But we seem to think in our culture or subconsciously that, you know, because my, my heart's been beaten for a while, and I've been walking around for a while, that somehow I've accomplished something. That now I deserve something. That something is coming to me. We use phrases like, God helps those who help themselves. In case you're confused about this, no, he doesn't. That's not in the Bible. God helps sinners. God saves broken people. God rescues those who are undeserving. John Stott says, Grace is divine love that sees, stops, stoops, and saves. I love the alliteration. I love that message. Grace is divine love that sees broken people, stops where they are, stoops to save them. That's grace. And this sounds wonderful and it sounds nice, doesn't it? But if you're honest with yourself, if you get down deep enough into this and into your own heart, there's a part of you and a part of me that really doesn't like grace that much, resists it. Even if we were honest, would reject it. This is the offense of grace and truth. The, how could grace be offensive? Well, truth says you're a mess, you're a wreck, you are a sinner, you deserve death. Grace says, you're loved still. You're loved anyway. But you can't get to the power of someone saying, I love you still, if you can't face the truth of your need. You can't have it both ways. You can't have one without the other. If you can't face the truth, you can't receive grace. That's why there's so many people, and frankly so many churches in our culture, that are peddling grace without truth. It's not grace at all. It's moral relativism. It's, it's you're okay, I'm okay. God is the grand, uh, sort of benevolent, tolerant, softy in the sky who doesn't really care what you do or say as long as you meant well and are true to yourself. This is not, this is not, has no power to change anybody's life. It's not grace. There's no edge to it. There's no truth to it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called this cheap grace. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, if you've not read that, I would really encourage you. Great summer reading. Uh, Bonhoeffer, if you don't know who he is, was a martyr in Nazi Germany for his part to try to overthrow Hitler and the Nazi party, but he was a faithful pastor and theologian, and in his very short life wrote amazingly about community and about what it means to follow Jesus. And here's what he writes about cheap grace and the cost of discipleship. Cheap grace is the grace that we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ himself. Costly grace, true grace, is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell everything he owns. It is the kingly rule of Christ, the call of Jesus, at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives the man his only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and it is grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son, and it is grace above all because God did not think that too high a price to pay. That's great. That's true grace. Now, so we think of grace, I think part of our issue is we think of grace as like a continuum. 
grace over here and truth over here. And if I'm going to be more gracious to you, that means I'm somehow less truthful. To move toward grace is to move away from truth. Or to move toward truth is to be ungracious. This is so wrong in our thinking. There are people who are grace mostly people, right? Grace only. They're mostly concerned with being loved and people feeling accepted. There are truth only people who don't really care about feelings so much. They want to be right. They want you to know that they're right. Do you know people like this? And you're probably on one end or the other of that spectrum. But that's not how God views it. Jesus is 100% grace and 100% truth. He's not gracious sometimes and truthful other times. He is full of grace and truth at all times. Something's probably wrong with you if everyone always loves you. Something's definitely wrong with you if everybody always hates you. But John says, we have seen his glory, that grace and truth took on flesh and walked around. And guess what? Everyone didn't love him. Everyone didn't love him all the time. Everyone didn't easily accept him. In fact, many people rejected him out of hand. Grace without truth is relativism. It's deceptive. It's false. But truth without grace is legalism, and it crushes people. You have to have both, and you find them only in Jesus. This is the freedom of grace and truth. As I said, one of our problems is we see it like a continuum. We desperately need truth in our lives. We desperately need grace in our lives. Is it gracious to not say something to a person that you love who is in a, caught in a pattern of destructive behavior? Is that a gracious thing to say, listen, to tell them the truth would hurt them, therefore I'm going to be gracious and not say anything about this? No. Years ago when I was a youth pastor here, one of the mom of one of the students in our ministry came to me and said, listen, my son is really in a dark place. We've, his counselor said, we, we need to have an intervention, family intervention, and we want a spiritual guide there as well. Would you be present? We're going to confront him about his behavior, about his substance abuse, and about a lot of things in his life. And I knew the family very well, and I said that I would. On the night that it was supposed to happen, she called me and said, I think we should call it off. I said, why? She says, well, I've been thinking and praying, and my son has had so many disappointments, so much brokenness, so much pain, that this, I think, would just be too hard for him. He really needs grace right now. You hear what she said? We can't tell him the truth because he needs grace. The most gracious thing that young man needed, and thankfully he received, was somebody to tell him the truth, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it hurts. That is grace. Grace only comes through the truth. You can't get it any other way. You can't circumvent that. And that freedom only comes when you face that truth. In fact, when I was first on staff here, I came on staff from a different church. This is over 18 years ago now. And Pastor Brian was, you know, a senior pastor. And I was uh, working on his staff as a high school and a pastor, student ministries pastor. And there's a part of my life that I was kind of, my wife knew about, but I was trying to, trying to handle on my own, and it was pretty ugly. I won't go into details now, but basically it was shameful. And I was hiding it, or at least I thought I was. And God was dealing with me slowly. And he said to me in a, in a very clear way, you need to confess this to somebody in spiritual authority over you. So I went to Pastor Brian, who was my pastor, but also my boss, which gets a little sticky. And I told him. I just coughed it up. Didn't give him any warning, poor guy. <laughs> just told him what was going on with me. And he didn't sweep it under the rug, pretend it wasn't there. He didn't ignore it or rationalize it. He faced it. We named it together. We dealt with it. We put together a process in place, but he extended grace. I was convinced in my mind, I think Satan had convinced me that if I ever talked to this, about this in the church, to Brian, you know, it would be, I'd never be viewed the same. I'd lose all credibility. But he sent a grace to me, grace that changed me. But the only way to receive that, the only way I could ever experience that, believe me, I tried for years on my own to get grace without truth. Can't have it. The only way that got inside my heart and began to do its work was when I could face the issue, when I could speak and hear the truth. Then grace can be grace. This is the freedom of grace and truth. You can't get freedom with only one or the other. They go together. It's not a continuum, it's two sides of one coin. True grace will lead us into truth, and real truth will always bring us to God's grace. How many of you have had the experience of you love a particular artist, a favorite, you have a favorite musician, anybody? Favorite musician, favorite athlete, 
favorite author, favorite actor, actress, right? Have you ever, through social media, that great arbiter of all truth, discovered something ugly about their life online? Somebody you admired? When I was a kid, it was Michael Jordan, right? He, everybody was Michael Jordan, squeaky clean, best athlete, you know? And then after his retirement, you find out maybe he's not so great after all. Maybe he's got some, some ugly parts of his life. And if you still are worshiping Michael Jordan, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but the truth hurts. Right? <laughs> the point is, right, you become disillusioned when you find out this person went through an ugly divorce or has a, whole, has a whole ugly side of their life, and then you think, well, can I still like their music? Can I still watch their movies? Can I still watch them play? Uh, or we think we have to sort of ignore it or rationalize it or sweep it under the rug in order to still like this person. Let me tell you how God looks at you. He knows all about you. He knows you to the bottom of your soul. He knows all the stuff you work so hard to cover up and keep from yourself and from other people. He knows everything you're ashamed of. And you pray silently that nobody would find out. And you know what? He's not disillusioned. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. He doesn't pretend it's not there. He sees it and knows it and names it and wants you to face it. And he loves you still. Maybe you've been around the church for a long time, but you've forgotten that. He loves you still. He loves you still. And still, in spite of all that stuff, this is grace. How is it possible? Because grace is not a concept. Grace is a person. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 tells us that now grace has appeared. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. How has it appeared? This is the person of grace and truth. The person of grace and truth. You know, the danger of big theological concepts like this, grace and truth, is that they would become abstractions that we don't know what to do with exactly. They're hard for us to... But that's the beauty of John 1. John is saying they're not abstractions. They're flesh and blood reality. They're walking around in action. You see how they look and exist and behave in real life. They're not the principles that you have to somehow apply. It's a person to follow. If you're struggling to get grace, try this hypothetical with me. Imagine a great and generous king who's always been kind to his subjects. In the midst of his benevolent reign, he hears that a part of his kingdom, some subjects have revolted against him and taken over his land. He sends messengers to investigate and to plead with them that he's not angry, and they kill the messengers. Then the rebels, they, they, they uh, fortify their position and they take a stand against the king. The king sends his own son, the prince, to plead with them to, to lay down their arms and come back and be welcomed back into the family. And you know what the rebels do? They murder the prince. Murder him. They hang his body on the wall of their little fort. What would you think this king would do? He has every, all the power and every right to send in the troops take back by force that which was taken from him, to pay back in kind those who murdered his son. But what if the king offers a full pardon? What if the king says, listen, I will accept the death of my son whom you killed as your own punishment, even though you killed him? Wait, what? What if the king says, you deserve death, but I'm going to accept the death of my son as your death, even though you're the ones that killed him? That makes no sense, does it? In history. Pretend you don't know the gospel story. What king acts like that? What king behaves like this? We'd be stunned and blown away to hear this. We'd think this is fairy tale stuff. And then what if the king says, I invite all of you to come live in my palace, eat at my table, enjoy all the pleasures of my kingdom. In fact, I'm going to make you sons and daughters. In fact, I'm going to make you heirs of my inheritance of the throne. I'm going to make you full shares in the inheritance of my kingdom. This is, this is ridiculous. Then he says, I won't even force you to accept this offer. All I ask, all I ask is that you acknowledge that you were wrong. You surrender and acknowledge you were wrong. Then you can receive all that I offer you. But if you won't do that, I'm afraid I'm going to have to put you in chains. Now, can you imagine somebody hearing that story and saying, that king, how ridiculous and intolerant of him to put people in chains. How dare he? Makes, you, you, some of you are chuckling. But that's precisely how the world views the gospel message. They don't understand it. They don't understand it. In fact, if, if you have never struggled to grasp the craziness of grace, if it's never blown your mind, if it's never blown open the categories of the way you think, if it's never been uh, challenged you that way, then you have never really understood it. Maybe you've been in danger of having cheap grace, what Bonhoeffer says, forgiving yourself. 
If you don't realize that you're that, you're that rebel, you deserve for the king to wipe you out. And he comes, and he doesn't just say, say okay, I'll give you a pass, but don't ever come back here again. He says, come on in. You're my son and my daughter. It's crazy. It's crazy. And if you've never seen it that way, then you don't understand it. The worst thing we could teach people is that they're just fine without God, that they're okay, that they're good. I know that sounds like a harsh thing to say, it's the worst thing we could say, because they're not. And it's not gracious to tell them so. Never, friends, never believe anything about yourself or about God that would make grace anything less than amazing and astounding to you. Because that's what it is. In fact, some of you have been around the church for a long time. And sometimes the danger for, for you is that you become kind of comfortable. You think, you know, I used to be, when I was first a Christian, I needed lots of grace. But now I only need a little bit. I mean, I, I still need some, nobody's perfect, but I need less than I used to need. Because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I'm better than that wreck over there. And have you seen the way he behaves? I mean, I'm, you know, on the whole, God, as if God's got this dispenser and he only gives a little to you because you're a good Christian. You're, that's, that's a sick way to think. It's totally unbiblical. And many of us subconsciously slip into thinking that. The danger for me, oh, you know, I'm a pastor. How, how crazy for me to think that I could preach about grace apart from his grace. Because I, because I, because I'm, you know, I really get it more than the rest of you. There, that's like saying a surgeon, you know, is going to give surgery to somebody who's perfectly healthy. Only the only the sick need a doctor. Jesus says. Well, here's the thing: there are no healthy people, spiritually speaking. We're all sick. We all have a need we can't meet on our own. John says, by closing here, that the way people would know the glory of the Father is to look to Jesus. That the Word became flesh. Why? So people could see the glory of God. What did that look like? It looked like grace and truth in the flesh, walking around, took on flesh, full of grace and truth, and from him we receive grace upon grace. But Jesus has been crucified and resurrected and ascended to heaven. In the first century, people looked to Jesus to see the grace and truth of God. Well, they can still look to him in the Gospels, of course, and we all must. But where do people get a flesh and blood example of the glory of God today? Where does the world get a flesh and blood example of grace and truth walking around? I'm going to stand here until you answer. <laughs> Us! I hope, if you've not been paying attention until now, I hope you wake up and hear this. You and I are to be the flesh and blood, grace and truth of Jesus Christ walking around. How, how does the world understand grace? By a theological bullet points? No. By the grace in your life. By the truth of your heart. People of grace and truth. Now, there are some of you here who have been crushed by the truth in your past. You carry around in you this burden that you're unworthy, that you're unlovable. And you need to hear the grace of God say to you, I love you still. I love you still. No matter how far you've run, what you've done. Some of you here, your whole life is built around telling yourself you're okay. You're buying the lie that you're fine, and you're not fine. And deep down inside, you know it. And the most gracious thing for you would be for God to say to you in his grace, the truth is you're not okay. All of us have people in our lives who need to hear a word of grace and need to hear a word of truth. John says, we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. How is the world to see the glory of God today in flesh and blood, in his body, the church, in your life and in mine, that we would be people full of grace and full of truth? Let's pray. Father God, as we prepare now to embark on a summer series where we study this amazing thing called grace, remind us as we go from here that grace is not a philosophy or a concept or a principle. Grace is a person. Grace is you, Jesus. In you, we find the fullness of grace and truth in you alone. Help us by your spirit to be people of grace. 
and by your grace to be people of truth. We pray this in your name. Amen.